Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Success in Sales, Hacks and Chats with Mike McDonald and a very special guest. We have Neil Robson joining me today. Neil, thanks for being a guest on the show. Thank you for having me. Neil is the co-founder of Rebel Chocolate, which which I'm sure you will hear from our discussion today. It's a very, very different spin on chocolate and how it impacts us as well. So I can't wait to dive in. So before we we start, Neil, could you share a bit about yourself? So a bit about your your background and a little bit about how you got started? Because I know that your background is in academics first and foremost. So should I share a bit about that? Sure, sure. So I'm a immunologist um, by training. Well, I had the at PhD level, and before that, I was a I did a master's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, but uh, life came along, and there was a bit of a twist. And about eleven years ago, I had a martial arts injury that damaged a um, a disc in my back. And this was sort of something that was aggravating at the beginning. And then over time, it got worse and worse. And we, so we were in Australia at the time, actually. My wife, now a wife and I, Suzanne, who's the uh, co-owner of Rebel Chocolate, also got a PhD in immunology. We did our PhD side by side in Glasgow. We were in Melbourne and I was doing cancer research at the time. And um, then we were there for five years and it was over the last two years of that that I was starting to really struggle with my back. And I was lucky enough to get a very prestigious fellowship from the Wellcome Trust to travel back to the UK. And at that stage, my back was getting really problematic. And it was internally very difficult. It was um, something that I was, every day I was thinking, God, is this going to end my career? I'd only you know, at that stage, boy, I'd only had my PhD for five years and wow. um, I was thinking this could be the end of my scientific career. And there was a lot of pressure actually because I because I had such a such a prestigious fellowship, I was thinking I need to achieve, I need to achieve, I need to achieve and and I couldn't. I couldn't do the work. I couldn't no. sit in the lab, I couldn't sit in the in the, the hoods, the fume hoods, the uh, sterile environments and it was just killing me. So um, it was a three year period where Boy, it was actually some pretty dark times, actually, um, trying to not achieving when my probably one of my primary senses of, you know, self-worth is probably whatever a type personality or something is um, achieving things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wasn't. And um, but carrying on from there, I got I was lucky enough to get another fellowship at Glasgow University. And that was for three years in the end. And I, I did OK there. I really fought hard to you know, achieve what I needed to achieve. And, um, but to the wards, the end, it got to the point where I was just, I couldn't do it anymore. I, I couldn't, I couldn't perform high enough. I couldn't, no. perform very high. I couldn't achieve, I couldn't do the hours needed to be able to be successful at, 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 an, at an international level. And I didn't want to, yeah, I got this and hand in hand with having issues with the university at the time. And, feeling quite um what's the word uh yeah not just unhappy with the whole structure of academia um realizing how limiting it can be and i was yeah just sort of had enough of that and had enough of the pressure and i thought to myself i need to change careers and believe it or not um lying there one day in bed thinking what can i do and i was thinking about nutrition i've always really been interested in nutrition and um, I was thinking about making a new type of snack bar and I was um, a bit tired of seeing fruit and nut type things in the supermarket and I was thinking of a milk-based snack bar that had higher protein content, you know, the whole thing about protein and diets and uh, protein being better for you, et cetera, et cetera. And it really came down to, I was thinking of flavors and I was thinking chocolate would be a good flavor in this bar. And then I thought, hang on a second, could you put protein itself into chocolate to make it mm. healthier? And that's what, in a nutshell, is what we're doing. What we did is we've we've got our chocolate and we use really high quality cocoa. So we the whole project was about having an amazing tasting product. But then it was the you know, you, sorry. Uh, you see, like say a bar of Cadbury's, it's got fifty six percent sugar. It's terrible, right? Really bad. There's mm-hmm. no redeem, there's very few redeeming features in standard milk chocolate. We were seeing <laughs> we we were seeing kids walking around. We've got a corner shop that sells like a bar of 
I mean, I'm going to say the brands, uh, Cadbury and Galaxy, you know, 110 gram bar, which has got 14 teaspoons of sugar, I think, for a pound. And you've got you've got 10 and 10, 10 year olds walking around eating a whole bar and you've seen these fat children and it was like, Oh my God. And it was, I mean, I was doing cancer research and things and I, I was doing that because I was trying to do something worthwhile to society. And when that came to an end, I mean, I still had that desire to do something worthwhile. And now we're really like looking at the obesity and we're looking at snacks and treats and we're thinking, well, what can we do to make these like treats better? I mean, we're certainly not saying don't eat treats. We love treats. We mm -hmm. love chocolate. We love chocolate. That's why we make it. Um, yeah. But it can be a lot better for you than, than what is currently available. Even, you know, even, you know, some big brand, big brands like green and black sort of looked upon as pretty high quality chocolate, although they're, they're not necessarily high quality chocolate, but the green and black milk chocolate still has, 47% sugar, I think, 45, 46, 47% sugar. It's crazy. Oh. It's absolutely crazy. It doesn't need to be that high. So I've gone on a bit of a rant here. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so, we, we, uh, so we're taking out basically this, the, our wee catch line is we're, we're taking out half the sugar and we're putting in whey protein from milk. And what that gives you is a, is a bar with 27% sugar and 25% protein. So we're not saying you, nice. more pro you don't have to eat more protein. We're not saying that, although it's actually interesting. You know, we'll get onto that in a minute, but um, it's to, <laughs> you can eat our bars and you go, wow, this is fantastic chocolate. And you don't know that it's got a healthier aspect. And that was the brief. If we couldn't achieve that, we wouldn't have done it, but we feel we have achieved it. And um, we're just moving forward with that. One of the, the things that I'm sure a lot of people listening will be thinking and I know that because I'm thinking the same thing and I am listening. So yeah. one of the things that sort of struck me is how did you actually go from, because you mentioned having your PhD for at least five years. Now, yeah. for those of you that know anything about academia, just getting to master's level is about four or five years, depending on what degree pathway you choose and then you've got to apply for a PhD you've got to actually study to get your PhD and then yeah. there's the research that you have to do post PhD so yeah. you've probably been in, in that system just from PhD and beyond like almost like 10 years if not more so yeah. What was the, the thought process like? Because I, I know that the back injury probably kicked you over the edge a bit. Probably like with the thing of it's now or never, I've just got to, I've just got to do it, you know? Yeah. But what sort of self-talk did you have from trying to actually convince yourself that even though you've been in the, the academic circles for, you know, borderline in a decade, if not longer, to then turn around and say, I'm going to completely change my direction. Because yeah. uh -huh. a lot of people wouldn't, and a lot of people might even have made their life easier while staying in the academic circle. So what was the self-taught like yeah. that convinced you to turn around and say, well, I'm just going to completely change. That's it. I'm just going to completely have a bit of a do-over, if you will, and go yeah. down a different road. Yeah, see, I, I mean, I could have... Fairly easily, I think, got a lecture lecturership position in a in a different university. Glasgow is a fairly high profile university, and I didn't actually even want to be a lecturer. You know, like I even from the very outset, I wanted to do research. I I, I wanted to do cutting edge research, research that could help people. And if I couldn't do that, I didn't want to just go into a teaching role, which I could have done. Um, it would have just bored me senseless. So the only way you can do research is getting money. Um, and the only way you get money is you have the profile to impress the people looking at your applications. Um, and it's, the research funding at the moment is horrendously competitive. I mean, one in 10 grants were getting funded when I left, which was a couple of years back. And this is one in 10 grants from established labs. These guys aren't coming out of nowhere. These are established groups applying for money and only 10% of them were getting, getting the funding. So um, the to be at that level, you have to publish in high profile international journals. And I, I did that in the past. But then I, my publish, publication rate was dropping because I wasn't able to do the work. And then it was becoming a reality 
that I wasn't going to be competitive for these grants anymore. And if I couldn't get the grants, I couldn't get the money, I couldn't do the research. And therefore, game over. And you're right about the, the time frame. I mean, from undergrad to master's, total was five years, four years to do my PhD. So, I mean, I was nine years in, in studying. So, and then about the same actually working in the field and then I gave gave up. So there's a hell of a lot of input, um, a hell of a lot of studying just to get nine years out of, out of, a, out of a career. But in saying this, I don't look upon my career necessarily as being over as a scientist. For, for example, um, I've had contact with a professor up in, um, now she'll kill me if I get this wrong, in Aberdeen, I'm sure it's Aberdeen, and she works, she works with protein in snack foods and protein, yeah. and, her, and her particular interest is protein consumption for elderly people because if you don't get enough protein, you actually age quicker and, and you, yeah. you age worse. So you, right. your, mus your muscles break down, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. there's a whole thinking at that level of like, we have to get people in different, like her interest is getting older people to eat more protein. And she's really interested in chocolate. She's interested in cocoa because cocoa has got some really interesting um, chemicals in it, like the flavonols for antioxidants. So if you put something like, She's really interested in our chocolate because you're putting cocoa together with high protein and it's ticking two boxes of what might be um, really worthwhile for someone who's not getting enough protein. Um, so I'm, I'm delving into the more, starting to delve into the more nutrition side of um, research. And I'm not saying I'm going to have my own lab or anything, but I have expertise that can that can feed into what other people are doing. And if we start making products with high flavonol contents or things like that, like chocolate with high flavonol contents and high protein, then we, we can work with people who are in the, in the nutritional field for sure. And yeah, that's really interesting to me. So it's still stimulating me. It's still stimulating. It's not, it's not hardcore cancer research anymore, but um, I'm really happy. I'm happy making the chocolate we're making. Yeah, I'm happy where we are, where I am at the moment. What was the, the steps to get started then? So you seem to have at least convinced yourself at the time to, to dive in. Like it, was, it was do or die time because you noticed the publication rates were dropping. There was more fierce competition for all the grants and things. So if anything, that probably made it easier to stop doing it than it was to do it sometimes. So <laughs> yeah. what was it? Easy, easy, the... is the wrong, easy is the wrong term. <laughs> <laughs> I spent, a, oh man, I spent, I spent a year like depressed, like really, oh. Like, oh, dark depression, like, like fighting, trying to fight to have, make something, keep something going and fighting and fighting and fighting yeah. just, and um, physically not waking up and not being able to walk some days um it wasn't it wasn't an easy decision for sure it was a decision that went from uh with the idea of really leave well actually just it was at least a year thinking oh, i've got to, i'm gonna i'm probably gonna be leaving science and then there was x numbers of months thinking well, what the hell am i gonna do with my life um chocolate just didn't jump out in the out of the air and suddenly be a reality if you know what i mean so it wasn't an easy thing at all yeah it was really really quite a difficult time so yeah, you, to your question. You did, yeah you, you did kind of i mean it, it came across simple just because of how easily you explained it but i'm sure simple can be dragged out over a long time and become complicated i'm sure there's there's a lot more to it um what what were the, the steps from you deciding chocolate and starting the company? So I'm thinking yeah. like business startup. I'm yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. starting point for starting the business because yeah. a lot of people do have ideas. I admit that I have ideas. People listening to this will definitely have ideas. But you've gone, okay, idea. I mean, I'm interested in nutrition. I mean, snack bars are great. You know, we've got all chocolate flavor. Oh, hang on. We need to make chocolate more, I guess, effective at helping people as opposed to hindering people. So yeah. at, at what point did you go from, okay, chocolate then, 
and then all of a sudden turn around and go, oh, Rebel Chocolate's born and, and it's going really well. So yeah. what, 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 what were the steps <laughs> yeah. to do that? Yeah, so we, I was working, so I was working part-time at the university because of my back and it was within that year period where I'm thinking, what am I going to do with my life? And then the idea about the chocolate came into my head and I'm very much a, I work on intuition and if I get an idea and it, and it just lights, lights, you know, like goes off in my head and I'm like, I'm, then I get very focused about it. So I was like, this is a good idea. I couldn't see anyone at the time doing anything like it. You know, look, we did some research, et cetera, et cetera. So it came with that um, initial, what's the word? Um, I was convinced it was a good idea. I was a hundred percent convinced it was a good idea. And uh, the other people around me weren't necessarily convinced it was a great idea. And some people <laughs> certainly probably thought I should carry on trying to yeah. find a, a more normal job. I mean, not oh, many, sure. you know, a more normal job, a more safe job, a safe job. And that wasn't me. So it went from and buying so i drove down to one of the local uh supermarkets bought the cheapest dark chocolate i could buy bought some whey protein and mixed them together in a bowl it was easy as that and i mixed it together it tasted horrible um it was grainy <laughs> lumpy. it tasted terrible right and yeah, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. right okay here's 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 the problem i know what i want here are the ingredients i want to put in it what i'll do now is do experiments so I did experiment after experiment after experiment. And what those experiments were is we bought um, a small grinder, which is a two kilogram stone on stone grinder. And we started pulling apart things and just adding the ingredients, grinding for three days, trying, trying the outcome. And it started off bad, you know, it started off really bad. And then it just took, it took eight months to get our recipe correct. So over that eight months was part of the time when four months of it was I was working part-time, then I left academia, then I spent four months full-time, no pay, no nothing, obviously, um, working on the recipe development. And then it got to a point when I thought, this is really good. This is, I want to eat this. I want to, I think people will want it. And the, I mean, the back one of the background things is really, really important is I have an amazing wife who has a, a stable job. So uh, how people do an idea like this without having someone helping them financially, like she's not, Suzanne's not paying for rebel chocolates bills as, as such oh. covering itself, but I can't pay the mortgage. Um, we're not making enough to, to contribute to mortgage payments, paying the bills at home. So Suzanne's been covering all of that for two and a half years now, I think. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I haven't had a salary at all. So um, we haven't made any money to pay pay us from the company. But we knew that. That was part of the plan. Where it's not it's not a problem yeah. per se because because we have someone stable in the relationship who can who can um, make sure the bank doesn't take away our home. Um, so <laughs> no. that, that was that, that was like a, a really massive thing. So un mm. underpinning everything is well underpinning everything is really Suzanne. Um, you should be talking to her. Uh, <laughs> she, pay, she, she gives the financial stability, and Suzanne works basically two jobs. So Suzanne does all our social media, which is a really massive thing to be doing. Um, you probably heard about us through Twitter or Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was Suzanne. Um, I don't even know the login details for our Instagram and Twitter account. <laughs> Um, I honestly don't, and she does. She does an incredible job, and yeah. we're getting loads of PR, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, how did it, we make it happen? I think was part of the. How do we go to make Rebel Chocolate a business? Is forming having a team where each of us has our strengths, and we each complement each other. And I couldn't do it alone. I mean, physically, I couldn't do it alone. I really couldn't. So. Um, yeah, I, I'm really reliant on having a, a very supportive partner. One of the, the things that, I mean, I know just from the businesses that, that I've got is that social media can become a full-time job. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh -huh. it's, not, it's not an easy task, especially when you realize that the only thing that really makes a difference is your output, really. Like, how yeah. much are you doing? So yeah. if you're only doing 
two or three minutes a day, well, someone doing half an hour a day is going to outwork you and probably get, you know, much a, a higher return, I guess, on the investment yeah, yeah, than yeah. you will. So, yeah, I, I completely attest to that. She's, yeah, she so is, I come home. She is taking on a bit of a mammoth task, to say the least. Mammoth task. And also, I mean, we, we're currently selling at markets and specialty events and food shows every weekend at the moment and nice. Suzanne, Suzanne does that as well so um, it's certainly certainly a long long day and a long week for her um, but yeah. she, be- she believes in it as well so that's the other Good. thing I've got a partner who absolutely believes we can make a success of this um, so if, if you're both convinced of that and you're both um, you know you've got a reasonable amount of what's the word you've done your research you've um you're selling well as well you know if as long as your product's moving and it's all moving in a positive direction then yeah go for it one of the things that um i am curious about as well is did your background in science and immunology and biochemistry help when it came to not just making sure that the protein in the chocolate actually still formed a chocolate bar rather than this <clears throat> this mess i guess or this 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 mush instead but also made it taste nice so what sort of skills did you bring to to that because people do learn skills people do have this idea of oh if, if i learned this thing maybe it'll benefit me or people could be even afraid to learn something even yeah. though cool. like, it means that you want to start off not being very good at something so did it, did you bring anything to the table when it came to creating the chocolate? And yeah. was there anything that you learned along the way as well? Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky. Well, if, you're, if you've worked in science or worked in any um, research-based field, I mean, you become, I guess I would be defined as quite a logical person. And you naturally, especially with doing a PhD, the, PhD, the main thing about a PhD is it teaches you to um, address um, problems and, and questions and how to ask questions and how to pull apart questions so although it's it, it's not it's not cancer you know I'm not trying to solve like solve the questions about cancer it when you I approached the making of a chocolate bar the way I wanted with the constituent parts uh, from a nutritional perspective um, I you did it very small steps because you've your chocolate's got maybe how many four five or six ingredients in it say but i needed the fat content to be a certain level for the protein to then not be grainy i needed mm-hmm. uh, but, I, but i still wanted a certain amount of protein yeah. and then the how did we get the, the chocolate how do we get the chocolate sweet enough at, with if you're taking out all that sugar how do you make it that someone eats it and go yeah this is really nice chocolate so mm-hmm. yes I, I i mean i took my science background certainly really, really helped with that. I mean, a chef, a chef would be able to do it as well, if you know what I mean. It doesn't have, you don't have to be a scientist to be able to reformulate food products, but it certainly helped um, having, having some, some, some special, some specialist knowledge of fats, carbohydrates, proteins, and how they work together when you're trying to form a food substance. Um, it would certainly be useful if anyone out there is wanting to try and reformulate some sort of food product. Um, so it certainly helped. It certainly helped. Um, but it's, you don't you don't need a PhD in immunology to make chocolate. No. Yeah. <laughs> what did you learn along the way? So obviously your your main thing is like I'd imagine making the chocolate and, and doing the that side of things. What did you learn when you were making the first batch, I guess, of, of the chocolate? And then is there anything that you learned the more that you did it? Ooh, um, so, I mean, it's multifactorial, isn't it? I mean, you, you're making the chocolate that's, so you, if you're making chocolate, that's one thing. And, you know, vast majority of people would have no idea how fiddly chocolate is. It is an incredible pain in the backside. So chocolate is really, really temperamental. It is temp- you've got to have the right temperatures, the right humidities, the right all sorts. And we started in a we started making it on a commercial level in a shipping container, literally a shipping container. So we had a grinding machine at one end of the shipping container and, and that that machine makes heat 
and then beside that we had a tempering machine which liked stable temperatures beside that we had initially we didn't even have a fridge we had a fan that blew over the chocolate and the chocolate wanted to be cool and well needed to be cool to be formed properly and we've got a machine two machines that one it you know two feet away making heat so it was it was a nightmare just trying to get get that right and then we had recently you know the hottest summer ever um, we had three months where we were struggling to make anything because we didn't we don't have the money to put in proper air conditioning we don't have the money for that air conditioning to be um, the type of air conditioning that will like properly dehumidify in a big environment um, so it was it's been a real struggle so I I see a factory I would love to have um, but it's it sort of it's partly like science. Well, there's a part of it that's like science in that, and this is why science does is very useful. Is so often, you know, nine nine point eight, no, ninety eight percent of the time or ninety percent of the time, science an experiment in science either doesn't work or it tells you something that you're not sure about, or it tells you something that it contradicts your previous result. So it's not very often that you get something really clear cut, and that if you do get something clear cut, it then repeats itself, and you go, ah, this is real. Um, so it makes you very determined and very almost um, very dogged about your approach to things. You don't want to give things up if you think they're right. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, so... And I've probably lost the train of <laughs> lost what your question was. I'm, 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 sorry, I'm beverly right. on so much. I'm beverly on so much. But um, <laughs> so we we are fighting all the time against basically the environment around us. Yeah. We don't have a specialized chocolate factory. We've recently moved into an um, industrial unit, and it's a big open space, and it's not air conditioned. So currently, it's raining outside, so the humidity is going up. So I'm worried about all the chocolate blooming. Um, but we, we're going to keep going and we're looking for investment to change that. So once we can get the money and we can start just, just growing, growing the business and um, making it more ideally suited for chocolate development. Well, if there's anything that the listeners can take away, it's you've got to just do whatever it takes to, to do whatever it is that you want to do like you're you don't have air conditioning so you've got fans you you recently worked it moved into a warehouse where there's no air conditioning so you're worried about the humidity and everything because you know that's it's a part of the process of making chocolate a bit of a background about my myself neil is i went to york a couple of years ago and I went to a chocolate factory to see how chocolate was made yeah, and how you we, how you split the the cocoa beans and all those things. And yeah. you can you can probably correct me on this because it was years ago, so I'm probably wrong. But apparently, uh, white chocolate gets its color from the actual fat that's in the the chocolate, like the the, the cocoa beans, as opposed to the um, the actual milk or something they put in it because people think that it's milk but i if i remember correctly it's, it's cocoa milk or cocoa butter or cocoa fat or something that actually gives it the the more higher fat content i guess is that is that right or have I are you talking about white forgotten? chocolate here you talking yeah, about I mean, white chocolate yeah i mean I've, I've i've heard or if i if memory serves it's the fat that, that's in it that makes it white and then mm. we take that out and then it changes the the consistency and the color and everything else so cocoa butter's um that's the one. <laughs> co cocoa butter is a yellowy color actually um and if you take if you Okay, a white chocolate from a supermarket is most likely the color it is, mainly probably from the sugar. Um, mm -hmm. the, if you put sugar and milk powder together and a little bit of cocoa butter, it will come out quite white, quite, you know, very, quite strikingly white. Um, the more cocoa butter you put in it, it actually will become slightly off white, off, it'll become uh, not okay. a shiny, brilliant white. Almost so, there. And, and uh, yeah, nearly, they're nearly there. So if you, <laughs> if you look at a high, really high quality white chocolate, it won't be the white color of Milky Bar. And it also depends um, if you deodorize chocolate, um, the cocoa butter. So, and this is slightly complicated. So you can deodorize cocoa butter. So if you take cocoa beans and squash the cocoa butter out of them and just use that, that will be yellower than if, if you've deodorized it, which some of the big companies do to their, their cocoa butter. So uh, okay. if, you a, if you take a really high quality white chocolate from Madagascar or something, it will actually probably be a yellowy ivory color. Um, but that's an aside. You've, you've got like, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah.
Well, I was. I must. I mean, I must have been close. I must have been. You're close. Uh, uh, you're close. Yeah, because I've yeah. noticed that um, white chocolate is white, and as you mentioned, the sugar and the milk and everything. It's like, well, it's hard for it not to be white if they put exactly. milk and sugar in it and yep. then leave the, the cocoa butter in. It's kind of like, well, of course it's going to be white. Yep. Um, one of the things that that does, it, well, it did surprise me is everything from how the bar breaks yeah so like whether it breaks or whether you can't actually break it right. all the way to how it tastes and the consistency and the feel of it like whether it's smooth or grainy or whatever the case is you can pretty much just manipulate the certain parts of like the ingredients you mentioned i think you mentioned five i think if i remember rightly is it just by manipulating those, you, you end up with something completely different? And I, I don't blame you at, at all. I mean, having the six months or eight months to, you know, get close to something that you would eat, which I think yeah. is a good thing to take away as well, is you've got to like your product in order for other people to consider it. Like, if, if you yeah. hate whatever it is that oh, you're yeah, selling, there's probably a lot of those people as well, you know? Yep. So it took you that long to do it, and it, I'm not surprised, because knowing what, what I know from that very, very brief trip in York is it's it's so easy to, to manipulate something and get a completely different result at the end. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, just from a... You know, if we take that and just really layer it over the business perspective, it's, you know, it's amazing what results you can get just by knowing what the ingredients are to your business or to your product or to your service or whatever it is. As soon as you know that and you make those little shifts towards something, you probably get very, very different results at the end. So I know we're using chocolate as an, an analogy now, Neil, yeah, which yeah. I, I apologize for taking right. your product and turning it into That's a right. metaphor, but That's it's, right. It's it's amazing what can happen. So, from what you know, from the the chocolate making all the way through to the health side of things and everything else, what sort of principles did you use, or I don't know, like just little things that helped make starting Rebel Chocolate and growing it that little bit easier. Oh boy, um, what made it easier? Um, I'm not sure if it's been easier. <laughs> it's easier, easier. What's made it easier? Um, repeat the question. <laughs> what? Well, I'll sort of simplify it. What? What sort of principles or things did you employ? Maybe lessons that you learned, I guess, because you know things get easier the more lessons we yeah. learn. Yeah. That actually made your your journey either faster or easier or more effective. Lessons I learned from the outset of Rebel Chocolate, you mean? Or lessons I learned yeah, from other things? Okay, from out the, what made it easier as I went along? Uh, uh, easier. Mm, uh, I could say like if you, <laughs> you know, if you realize you don't know what you, a good way saying is, you don't know what you don't know. Um, you've got to, it hasn't been easy that's the thing though it really hasn't been easy um every step of the journey you're learning something new um so it's a continual learning process and if if i could turn back time and go back six months then um i would be able to do it a lot quicker so i haven't there's, there's been nothing there that's like, su like suddenly like was oh well, this is ma making things easier it's having you've just got to get in there and do it You've just got to get in there, hands on, do it, uh, do do things with the 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 best you can from what you've learned in like your life, like your skills that you have. For instance, my background in science, so I, from everything I've took forward through Rebel Chocolate, I was like, you know, how would I do this? I'm just naturally applying what I already know from other things. Um, but no, there's nothing. Yeah, it, it hasn't been an easy journey, and we're learning all the time. I mean, we. Yeah. This sounds like a small thing, but we've managed to cut our processing time from four days down to three days simply by changing the order of what we've added the ingredients. And it, I mean, I didn't know that. You know, like it was like, why would you add the sugar then when that or not then? Yeah. And then suddenly wow. it's like, and that actually makes a big difference to us now because now we can do two batches a week instead of one batch. And it made a big yeah. difference just because we added the sugar on day at the first day. So it's a continual learning curve. Yeah, it's, it's just a continual learning curve. I mean, from 
from people that that do have to produce things, saving a full day is, is massive. I mean, you, you're able to, as you said, you have to double your, your production yeah, weekly just from yeah. saving a day. So that's, mm. I mean, that, I was always blown away when you said that. I thought you were going to say a couple of hours. Uh, no, 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 whole day. But you managed to yeah. save a full day, which yeah, is, yeah. well, wow, that's pretty, go from one batch a week to two, you've almost doubled your work rate by, yeah. well. No, no, no. And we need to, that's the thing. So we're only making, we're making, typically 25 kilograms of chocolate a week, which is absolutely tiny. Um, and we need to be making 100 kilos and selling 100 kilos a week before we can mm. start taking any sort of money from it. And that was always the game plan. So that's not a problem, but it's then with the resources we have, how can we get to uh, up towards 100 kilos a week? And if we can get our production from four days down to two days, which we're... So the next thing is to try a new trick and to try and gain another day and then we can make a batch every two days and then we can make three batches a week and then it's 75 kilos a week without yeah. having to spend any more money so mm -hmm. what I, okay a lesson learned is how do you keep pushing always keep pushing for efficiency if you can be efficient your efficiency means money right and business and and i've I'm not a business, well, I am a businessman now, but I wasn't at the beginning, and you're learning business skills, and I mean, if you're a scientist, you want to be efficient as well, but in, in business, it really does come down to, you need to sell a certain amount of product to, to make this business viable, so how can I make it as viable as possible, and that really comes down to a massive part of that, is how do you make the processes efficient? Well, I'm actually quite happy I managed to uh, near claw that one from you there, Neil. Uh, it was something that you, you didn't realize that you knew, but uh, yeah, there you, go. Yeah. you know, that sort of takes us back to the first one. I said, you don't know what you don't know. And, yeah, you don't know what you don't know, exactly. I, I feel slightly proud I managed to do that. Yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> You've only so, made me bloody verbalize it. I think I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks anyway. <laughs> so you mentioned that if, if you were to go back and do things again with what you know you would do things faster you'd be better whatever the case is so what would you tell yourself if you could go back six months Ooh. Hmm. well obviously i'd tell myself to start adding sugar before other things <laughs> Uh, this is a, a really Love simple. The, I'd, I'd change the process slightly, but it all comes down to it all comes down to the fact that you've got to sell it as well. Remember, so which would come the equation would then be if we can make it more efficiently, I could have more time to try and get customers. So therefore, we would have sped up the process. We'd be selling more now if I could have gone back six months and made the process down to two or three days instead of four days, because I'd have the mm. time, I'd have more time. Yeah. So, and as a business owner, um, like Suzanne does huge amounts of the selling, a lot of like the contacting of customers, but both of us, a big part of it is we have to contact customers. We, we sell through retail, we sell online, we sell at markets and things, but our retail customers is, is really important to us. So, you've got to go and get them. You've got to go and find them. And if you're making chocolate all day and you're exhausted and your back's killing you and you need to lie down and you can't face calling people, then that's a problem, right? You can make chocolate until you're blue in the face, but if you can't sell it, the business goes down the drain. So yeah, yeah, yeah it would go back and just, well, I'd just start over again and I'd probably find it a new, you know, new quicker ways to make chocolate. I mean, we could buy, there's machines, the big companies use machines that make chocolate within a day like literally like 12 hours it will there's massive machines so the big some of the big companies use machines that make six tons of chocolate at a time Whoa. so and that's in so they grind it in these machines for about four to six hours and then they do a process called conching for a few hours there you go six tons of chocolate just like that so yeah. if you had the money to be able to start well what we want to do in the future is probably start looking at some of these types of machines but one, the baby machine, the baby machine that can make a few hundred kilos like this starts at, I think it's 50,000 um, pounds. And that's right. only one, one part of the processing line. So one of the realities that you, you've got to be um, clear about when you're, you're going into a business like food manufacturing, if you're going to do the manufacturing yourself, is it's going to be expensive. And if you don't have a lot of money to begin with, you've got to understand that 
you've got to do it bit by bit. And that's what we're doing. We knew that. We're, we're building the business block by block and um, increasing sales um, step by step. And they're going up, every, you know, our sales are going up every month, um, which is what, what we need. Um, yeah, so it's it's no quick fixes, I don't think. There's no quick fixes in, in most people. I mean, you know, we're not BrewDog. We, don't, we probably won't be BrewDog, if you know what I mean. Um, so we're not necessarily going to be worth a billion dollars in... 10 years, um, but I'm sure we'll be successful in the next few years if we keep applying the same principles as what we've been applying. All right, yeah, sounds good. I mean, it seems like you're you're on the right path anyway. I mean, if because you seem to know what the blocks are, you, you're learning as you go, you're learning like what the, the puzzle pieces are to fit in and all those things. So sometimes it is just a case of time. Sometimes it is just a case of using what resources that you have. So, yeah, you seem to be on the right path anyway. So, yeah, mm. thanks for, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Building a brand, I mean, one thing we're doing is uh, we're building the brand Rebel Chocolate. And, again, this is a huge part to do with Suzanne, my wife. Um, people know about us and people are growing to know about us. And we, we haven't spent anything on advertising yet. Yet we've been on BBC radio programs twice. We've been in the Herald a number of times. Um, hopefully Suzanne's going to have an article in the Telegram about her this week or next week I've just been contacted by BBC Radio for food program to do an interview for their food program this is all people contacting us we've had two companies three companies actually come to us uh, really cool companies wanting to do collaborative projects and this is us making 250 chocolate bars a week um, but the brand is 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 getting out there and the brand is being seen as a as a cool brand that makes great chocolate if someone wants to find out more about yourself, Neil, so who you are, what you've got going on, and also Rebel Chocolate as well. So give people a chance to, to get involved, give people a chance to maybe even buy a chocolate or 10. Um, well, where, where, where can people go to find out more? For your listeners and within the UK, I mean, we sell online. So go and check out our website, which is obviously www.rebelchocolate.co.uk. And we will post you chocolate anywhere in the UK as um Order what you want, and we will package it up and get it to you usually within 24 hours. Um, and that's about it. I mean, if you live in Glasgow, it depends where you're living. We, we do have outlets around. We have got uh, a couple in England now, but mainly if you're mainly from in Scotland, we're like going Scotland out the way. Um, so go online, have a look at our website, see what you think, and um, go from there if you'd like to buy some. All right, awesome. Well, those of you that are listening and you, you know people that like chocolate, then, you know, what, what are some of the, the health benefits? I know you've probably got a long list that's probably longer than both your arms combined, but what sort of key benefits are there to taking sugar away from chocolate and adding chocolate in, adding chocolate, adding protein, protein into yeah. chocolate as well? Yeah. So, I mean, it really came down to, I mean, uh, uh, sugar is such a big thing at the moment. And I mean, we shouldn't just, just think about sugar. We should think about sugar, fat and everything. We should be thinking about calorie intake basically. But what we're trying to do is, as I think I said at the beginning is the first thing is make great, great chocolate that people want to eat. There's no point putting a healthier twist on chocolate if no one eats it. So that's the first thing we're, we're trying to do. Um, so now I've lost your question again. God, my brain's fried. You know, like, doing a <laughs> yeah, like this I do. Yeah. leading up to December for a chocolate maker, it's like, oh, my God, it's a healthier <laughs> chocolate. Why would, what is in it for anyone? So what I would say is if, if someone can eat our chocolate and they think, wow, this is amazing, they're getting amazing chocolate, but they're not getting all the calories from sugar. So compared to a bar, if you want to go and eat 50 grams of um, any other chocolate, milk chocolate, you're probably going to be getting nearly 30 grams of sugar in that, where if you eat ours, you'll get less than 15 grams of sugar. And if you can, that approach of, of what's, the, what's the best word for it? Um, healthy Isine, healthy Isine treats. So you guys have made up a, a, a word from somewhere. If we can do this in the whole treat market, right? If we can start changing treats so that they're more nutritionally balanced by using tricks. And that's was probably where the science comes in. I mean, I use, we use science. We do use science in our, in our, in our chocolate, the protein side of it, but also 
a chocolate is lactose free, which is really important, which I haven't mentioned yet. And so if you take lactose and uh, you're probably aware of this, but lactose is like a disaccharide sugar of glucose and galactose. And if you cleave it with lactase enzyme, you get glucose and galactose. And lactose isn't sweet. So when someone makes milk chocolate, typically they you get the sugar from lactose, but it's a waste of time because you don't mm. gain get any sweetness from it. It's just useless calories. Right. Yeah. So if you cleave it and you get glucose and galactose, our milk powder, because it's lactose-free, tastes sweet. So therefore, we don't have to add as much sugar. So there's one of the science twists. Got you. Yeah. So our sugar, oh, sorry, our sugar, yeah. our chocolate actually has four distinct sugars in it, where most chocolate has just sucrose. Um, and those sugars sort of all work together to synergize to give you sweetness. So we're using tricks, firstly, to make it, Tastes satisfying, satisfyingly sweet. So people, people eat our chocolate and go, hmm, this is lovely. It's not as sweet. Um, you don't need so much sugar in things. Sugar is really cheap. So sugar is a tenth of the price of cocoa. And all these big companies put in crap loads of sugar because mm. it, it's cheap. It's probably addictive. Um, and people can't keep coming back for it like because it's like that, that sugar hit. Um, but you don't need that. You don't need that level of sugar, sugar to get satisfying sweetness. So, say if we did this over the whole treat, mark, whole sort of all the treats you could think of. If you start trying to say, can we take out that, some of the sugar and but put something else in that makes it a bit more nutritious? That might change the landscape of like the the nutrition profile of everything like we eat regarding treats, and wouldn't, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, it it seems I quite like the more more balanced approach to, to treats and things I think that you're probably right things are too sugary and I think we are addicted to the high as well we just keep getting back for more which obviously the companies want so that's you know you spend you spend more money on chocolate that way right if it's addictive and you keep going yep. back with the sugar so yeah it's uh yeah interesting so Neil we are just about at the end and I've got one last question that I ask everybody and we've had funny answers all the way to serious answers to answers that i would honestly never would have thought so right. we can blow the the hole wide open on this one all right okay and it's what would you like the world to know about you that it doesn't already know Ooh, the world holy crap <laughs> um, that I that I have a sincere desire to try and try and help the world while I'm here. That's it. All right, short and, and sweet. If, that, if that's well, through healthier chocolate, so be it. Short and sweet, which you know, with more than one <laughs> sugar. Uh, <laughs> all right, Neil. Thanks for being a guest on the show. Those of you that are listening and tuning in. Make sure you check out Rebel Chocolate if you haven't already. Let me know if you like the episode by sending me a message on the social media places. And if you like the show, if you want to make sure you keep up to date, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any of our future guests. Neil, thanks again. I appreciate Thank the time. You, and I'm sure we'll keep in touch. Great. Thanks very much. Cheers.